Greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Pizzolo, and I am here with Bass Musicians Magazine interviewing the one and only, the iconic, the thumping, rocking, jazz swinging, amazing bass player, Daryl Jones. Daryl, thank you for being here. My pleasure, Chris. I'm looking forward to speaking to you about all this stuff. So there's a lot going on for you at the moment. You have a new documentary. You have some new music coming out. Um, mm -hmm. You have a line of instruments that are coming out and then all of that while doing a, um, a pretty incredible day job as well. Yeah. <laughs> Recording and touring. Um, we'll get into everything in a minute, but there's something that's been on my mind that I wanted to ask you especially after watching the documentary in the blood. Um, what's your earliest memory of the bass? Like not the instrument, but the sound and, and the, and maybe like the first, like your earliest memory of hearing it on the radio or something and it's standing out to you. It would actually, you know, it's funny when you, that you asked that question. The first thing that occurs to me is my parents uh, throwing a party in the basement. And I probably was three or four years old. And just that sound of Motown coming through the floor, that sound of, to be more specific, the sound of Jamerson coming through the floor, you know, that, you know, you, you can't hear, you know, you hear that fundamental, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's interesting because I think that that also has informed my bass sound, you know, like in the fact that I really dig using like a lot of watts because I feel like the bass is a sound that should be not only heard, but really felt, you know. So that and, you know, and, and all the guys like, you know, all the great bass players from, you know, the Miles, Miles Bands, Count Basie, Oscar, um, Oscar Peterson, who my, my dad listened to a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, all of those guys is, is, you know, Ron Carter and Sam Jones and, you know, all of those guys basically coming through the floor is that's amazing. yeah that's 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 incredible man and then and when you were you started playing music at a pretty young age yeah 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 i think i was seven when my dad started teaching me you know just basic you know how to read rhythm you know basic uh basic uh, uh rudiments and stuff like that on on, uh, on a practice pad it was even before before there was a drum set in the house wow and then did you graduate to like a, uh, like I know it's Steve, I think Steve first had a snare only when he first started playing drums as a kid. Steve Jordan. Well, I had, yeah, there was this, actually, I got the snare, the first snare I got was from the school. It was, you know, being a part of the, the you know, the grammar school band or the elementary school band. That was the first snare that I had. I, wow. I think I started, I switched to bass before I really, I got too involved with the, you know, with the drums actually, other than, you know, my dad teaching me how to read rhythm and stuff. That's cool. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to give too too much away because the, the documentary in the blood is is available now. Um, mm -hmm. and it, it really does chronicle your your life story and, and your journey um, mm -hmm. to music. And I, I think it's pretty interesting because where you grew up in Chicago, I feel like the environment in which you grew up and the neighborhood in which you grew up really influenced a lot of um, your your musical community from a young age and i found that really cool and, and, and fascinating um you know how how is that kid from then in chicago um how is that you now you know how did you make that journey and and i mean i it's a it's a long journey i know that but but the kid that was playing the rudiments and that's still in all of us right as musicians we always kind of keep that light but but um yeah how do you how do you keep it now? Like, is there anything that you learned from that from that time in high school and, and even going into college and playing and probably even before that? Like, is there is there anything that you keep with you today, you know, when you record or when you practice? You know, I think um, you know, as you said, you'll hear the 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 the, the story in, in the documentary, but the the my first teacher, Angus Thomas, who I talk about in the film, I was his first student. I don't think that he knew that he was a good, a great teacher. He en en ends up, he was a really great teacher. And maybe for, maybe the, 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 the primary reason would be that he really made me play that version of thank you for letting me be myself, which I must say is not the same version 
that Larry Graham is playing on Thank You For Let Me Be Myself. It was like a simplified version just with fingers, but he really made me play it right that first day. And, um, and I think more than anything, man, that I got put on the path to play correctly in time with tone, you know, with consistency that he made me do that from the beginning, I think is probably the biggest thing that I still carry with me. Is wow, really, that's that's really yeah. heavy, right? Because that's like, that's a combination of things. That's like, I, there's a saying I heard one time that uh, the difference between an amateur and a professional is that an amateur practices until they get it right and a professional practices until they can't get it wrong. And, oh, that's good. I like that. I like know, that. I'll be using that on students from now on. <laughs> you know, but, but um, but it's it's interesting because that's a really crazy lesson to learn at a young age. And I, I feel like that parallels sports and that parallels a lot of things where you have to be so open minded to take that criticism and and be willing to get it right because of how many yeah. steps it takes to get there. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine that built an incredible work ethic in you. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Well. <laughs> you know, my work ethic is. You know, it's like everybody's. I guess it's really great sometimes and not good so other times. I do remember uh, it made me think about playing with Oz Noy, and uh, you know, listening to the music when he sent it to me three months before the gig, and then thinking, oh, it's not that hard, and, <laughs> and then three nights before I'm going to play with him, realizing, oh shit. I needed to spend a lot more time and literally, and so my work ethic kicked in then, but it was 48 hours before the gig, which is maybe <laughs> not the best work, ethic, work ethic. Yeah. but you know, I was able to, you know, go on and handle it. But, um, but no, I, I think, um, yeah, the, 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 from the, from the perspective of knowing that you're getting it right, you know, Knowing that, okay, I know that well enough to go out and play it, you know, or go out and read it, which was the particular case with uh, with, with Oz on that in that particular case. Um, yeah, no, I, I think uh, he just taught me, you know, he taught me what's right, and um, and even I think I can think about you know down the line a few you know a few years later where I was starting to, you know, learn how to play fast, you know, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and I remember, you know, kind of waiting for him to come back in town, as he, whether he's in college or away or, and playing fast for him and him, and him saying, okay, yeah, but now you got to clean all of that up, you know, and your fingers are moving too much, you know? So, yeah. so um, I think that uh, because he was also like a, you know, a little bit older than me. He was a kid that was looked up to in the neighborhood. My parents liked him. Yeah. Um, um, I, I think I was, you know, I was trying to impress him. And also, you know, when you think about the reasons that we all become musicians or the spark, um, it's a certain amount of acceptance that we're looking for. And so I think that I realized that it was a it was a chance for me to to really gain some acceptance. And so um you know, I worked, I was, I was willing to work hard at it. I mean, I don't think back when I think I just played all the time. I just, you know, pro, you know, played all the time and practiced, you know, there were some times, times in my life where I practiced quite a lot, but more, more than anything, I just played a lot. And, uh, yeah. And so I think, uh, you know, that stuff is involved with how I addressed it, work ethic and, and, you know, and, and a certain um, quality control and things like that. Yeah. How do you how do you define practice? You know, for like for and and not being so philosophical as the last one, but like like now, what what does practice look like to you? Or or do do you practice at this at this stage in your in your career? I'm I'm kind of trying to get back to to it. You know, um, there there were a number of years that I didn't practice so much. But what it's interesting that you asked that question. The first thing that came to mind was. To me, practices is attempting to play something that I don't know well. Um, because, you know, it's really easy to pick up an instrument. I'm trying to learn to learn to play guitar now as well. And I've, I've, I have to say that I'm kind of stunted 
on the guitar because I pick it up and I play stuff that I already know. Mm -hmm. And you don't get any better by doing that. So for me, when I think about practice, it's trying to um, trying to uh, to uh, expand my level of ability, you know. On, on that, instrument, you know, trying to, to you know, trying to learn so, to play something comfortably that I don't know how to play, that I don't yet know how to play very well. Yeah. So for a gig like, um, you know, a, a gig like the you recently put out a, a record or Robin with Robin Ford and, and, and a bunch of other great cats. Um, do you, you know, and, and you'll be touring on that soon. Yeah, you guys will be hitting Japan. Yeah, we're, well, we're just going to Japan for a few gigs. Yeah. Um, is that is that a gig that you would practice for maybe more than a gig like the Stones? Meaning, like you know, I always see these behind the scenes videos of artists, you know, big arena tours where they might just be warming up and stuff. But for a gig like Robin's, you're going to Japan. Is the, and the material I'm assuming is something that maybe you know isn't in the blood. You know, it's not it's not second nature. These songs. You know, is that something that you that you spend a lot of time with right before the the gigs or not even at all? Definitely some, you know, making sure that I that I can cover the stuff that I need to cover. But again, um, we recorded it, so it's 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 there somewhere. I just need to play it enough to kind of uncover it again. That was January of 2020, right before everything kind of hit the you know hit the fan. Um, but what I will practice more is what the, the harmony. I'll sit down and say, okay, what, you know, what do I play over this area? What do I play over this change so that I can kind of, because what I really want to do is I want to get loose. I want to, I want to understand, um, you know, the harmony and, and what, what's happening where to the point where I don't have to um, worry about it. It's kind of like the thing that you said about, you know, being able to play it well enough where you don't, you know, you don't make mistakes, you, 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 you know, or not that you don't make mistakes, but that whatever you do is informed by, you know, the, 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 the vision that the, that the author is, is kind of putting forth, you know, I want to be loose on that stuff. So I'll be looking at the harmony probably more than anything and looking at, you know, particularly stuff that I'm going to, in that arena, stuff that I'm going to solo on, I'm finding more and more uh, that I need to 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 really study that stuff and be a little bit more loose. That's what I what I'm reaching for now at this point. I just listened to some some music that um, I recorded uh, that that uh, I've toured with um, Nils Landoki, um, Harvey Mason, Bill Evans. Um, we did a tour this past uh, uh, fall, wow. and I'm listening listening back to some of this we recorded in Leva Cruz, and I'm listening back to that stuff and thinking to myself, you know, I, I could I could solo better than, than <laughs> what I'm hearing. And so again, so that's stuff that I'll I'll try to go and shore that stuff up before we start playing again, whenever that's going to be. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm curious, Daryl. What um uh, what excites you now like what what is something that you find exciting about specifically about the bass guitar uh these days is it is it any piece of gear in particular or any anything you've been listening to or anyone playing another instrument that maybe gets fired up um well um oh yeah i can in a way kind of all of those things i i um i've been listening to john schofield man and uh i i I want to understand his approach a little bit more, you know, particularly as it, it you know, as it goes to writing, because he's a great writer. Uh, he's a great, you know, great soloist, a great, you know, you know, um, he, he does everything well. He's great, great feel, you know, all of those things. So that's something um, I'm excited about. Uh, not that I've totally got my mind and hands wrapped around it at this point, but for the last couple of years, man, I've been li really listening to and watching a lot of videos um, of, uh, of uh, oh my God, his name just escapes me just as I'm about to say it. Uh, um, uh, Barry Harris and his 
and I don't know if you're aware of who he is. Barry Harris yeah. is a piano Barry player. Harris, tell me about him. Barry Harris is a piano player. He just died died uh, 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 last year. But he is one of the um, foremost jazz educators. Um, and it's not the kind of jazz education that he speaks so badly about. <laughs> Um, you know, in schools, but he is more trying to teach you what those guys were thinking and the way that they were thinking at that time. And it wasn't a lot of like, oh, you know, Lydian, you know, Lydian, you know, augmented Lydian. It's it's not it's not that stuff. It's a few other ways that they are looking at um, at that music and how you improvise over that music. Uh, what note land? What notes land on 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 strong beats? and how you arrange that. It's something that I'm excited about it because it's something that I really wish somebody had kind of pulled my coat to 40 years ago. So I'm really excited about the Barry, Barry Harris thing. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, things like that. Um, how about gear? What are, is there any gear, gear that you get excited about pedals? Or are you a pedal person? I'm, um, I, there are a few things, man, that that, uh, that that people have turned me on to. I've um, there is the uh, I have to think of trying to find the name of this thing. Um, the Helix by Line Six is a piece of gear that they uh, that they gave me a little a short time back, but I've not had very much of a chance to to really dig into it. So I'm excited about that. Um, uh, always excited about you know some kind of little digital delay pedal that I can play along with. Oh yeah, you're into you're into delays. Yeah, I'm definitely into that kind of stuff. Um, cool. I you know I go back and forth, but but that's something that I'm really excited about. So will you will, will you do like a looper and and if you yeah. loop, how long will you do like a four second loop an eight second or will you go longer? Oh, you know different you know different ones for different things. You know I got a tune that I've that I've been working up that I think I'm going to play with. The Nils Landoki band. Uh, we're going to play a tune that I wrote, but I literally put almost the whole, you know, the two sections or the two major sections of the song. I loop, you know, which would be, you know, six, eight, ten, twelve seconds, I guess, maybe even more. Wow, um, that's awesome. Um, so yeah, just you know, and, and when I'm playing it by myself, then obviously it's a chance for me to to kind of play over the changes that I that I wrote for the song. So those things I'm interested in. Um, there are a couple of other ideas in terms of effects, man. What I'm m really curious about is the more vocal effects. And in order to do that, like vibrato, for instance, but vibrato with that I can bring in and out. Um, so, da -ba -da 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 -ba -da -ba -da, you know what I mean? Like I can actually do more vocal type things. And, and, um, there is a pedal, I've been talking about this pedal with different companies, that Emmett Chapman developed. And, you know, it was, you know, one, one of the things that he did along with the Chapman stick. But it's called a patch of shades. And it's this pedal that's got a, a pressure sensitive pad. And so I think that if you were to connect a distortion pedal into it, that yeah. you can bring in a certain amount of distortion so da 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 that compression you could do something with compression you could do something with you know so it's that kind of more vocal kind of sounding stuff like the Leslie thing a little bit that you know it's not just by yeah 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 it's like by yeah it's like like those kind of things and and I found there's some like there's some Eastern um flutes and stuff. Eastern flutes and stuff that have that similar kind of where it's not just one kind of vibrato, but it's like a couple of different things interacting with each other. So I'm interested in that. Kind of excited about trying to go down that wormhole. The, That's cool. Or rabbit hole. Yeah. Well, now when you go when you go on tour, are you is it do you ever stop in, in music shops? Is that like on the on the list in, in certain cities? Yeah, um, um, I did that a lot more before I started building instruments. I must say, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sure. Now, uh, now that I'm looking at like bark and trees and things that are, you know, like say that again. 
<laughs> so you're probably looking more at like the the trees now, where you know, and and yeah, no, I'm definitely having conversations with with uh, with Chuck Lavelle, who is you know, who is a forester about you know, hey man, as you know, are there any interesting things that you know that I should know about this or that or you know alder? What's you know what's you know what's up with an alder alder tree? You know, so definitely that stuff, but also you know, I love you know. Um, you know, uh, vintage instruments, and if I can find things that that are um, are really kind of unusual, I've got a uh, actually behind you can't really see it, but I've got a uh, a Fender Bass Five, which uh -huh. was a five string bass that Fender made in 1965, I think. And so it's uh, Daryl. Is know. that the one? Is that the one that is the Fender Bass Five, the first one to have the low B, or is that the one with the high C? Well, you know what, man? I have a feeling that they meant for you to 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 um they meant for you to uh to oh. do it with a with a with a with a high C because if you'll notice it it goes it only goes up to B flat on the G string. Yeah, yeah. It's, the body is a Mustang body that's elongated. And so it only goes so what I figured out is that if you went to a E A D G C, yeah. then that would be C. That would be D E flat. It puts you back at the same, um, uh, 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 you know, it puts you back where you get it, you know, uh, uh, up to a high E flat on the on the on the uh, on the on the C string. Right. So it puts you back in the same range as a regular Fender bass. Uh, I have actually put put a low B string on mine. I had to do a lot of work on that bass, Carol, to get it. Fender Five with a low string B is like next level. Like that is something that is so. It's like the unicorn of basses. It truly. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, it it is very very cool, you know. Yeah, and so those kind of things I'm interested in, you know, yeah. um, you know, off the beaten off, off the beaten path things. By you know Fender or Gibson or who whomever you know there's a lot of a lot of tell me uh, about the base behind you what what is that what is that base directly behind you there this base this is uh this is uh, a uh, this is a Chatham base this is like the so I grew up in an area in Chicago called West Chatham so as you can see it's reminiscent of a very well known. Uh, maker, you know, I don't know. We, I don't mind mentioning Fender because I think Leo got so many things right that it's hard to hard to do make a move without you know without touching on something that he that he did or that the people he and the people that were dealing with Fender did. So this is like the the basic instrument from from my company from Jones Musical Instruments. So that's kind of like our version of a precision, you know. Amazing! I love the cutaway. It's so sleek and looks so good. And I can't wait to, to touch one. So, so, talk a little about Jones Musical Instruments, man. How, like, what's what is it? How is it happening? And and, and you well, know, how can I get one in my hands? Yeah. Uh, well, basically, you know, just talk to me, or you know, or, or you know, go to the that website. That's like a difficult thing to do to, to anyone watching. How 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 does someone? How do we get? How do we talk to you? How, how does someone well, get like as as you know, as as you know, we've been talking about kind of trying to um, upgrade the website because there is a Jones Musical Instrument website. Basically, most of the orders that I've taken have been through that website, where people tell me that they're interested in the instrument, and then I or somebody else, you know, who's working yeah. with me on the things, yeah. reach out to them. So we've sold a few in Japan. We've sold, you know, a few. Um, with bass player friends of mine, the guy who taught me, Angus has one. He's living in Austria. Um, Angus, Angus has 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 a, a, a Jones. Yeah. Wow. yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, and actually, one of my students, a guy named Daniel Pearson, who played with you know with 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 a, with a bunch of people. Uh, he also has one. Um, this actually, uh, Keith and Mick and Ronnie. Uh, uh, have have Jones guitars because I'm also making. A Stratocaster type instrument and a Telecaster type instrument. So how did how did it start? When when did the idea come to you? And then how did you go from idea to, to execution? Well, uh, actually, kind of a, a bit bit a uh, bit of a um a circuitous uh, route out. Um, so um, as I was saying, uh, the the the, uh, the 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 fretless bass that I showed you earlier. 
uh, was uh, designed by and built by a guy named Albi Balgoshin. And after we built that base, we were looking at the price of, of pre CBS instruments just starting to rise and just go crazy. And we were thinking, well, maybe we should do see if, let's 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 see if we can come up with like a production instrument that feels like a pre CBS instrument, but that if a kid worked at McDonald's for six months or for a year, that it's something that they could afford rather than the six or eight or Ten thousand that people were starting to pay at that time for you know for pre CBS uh, Fender instruments, um, and so he started building instruments for me, and he would send me stuff, and I would play it, and I would say, well, let's do this, and let's change the shape, and got into it really in that way. We eventually were had a, had a, had an instrument that we were selling uh, under his um, um, a basis through his company. Oh. After a while, we decided to license it to Lakeland, and that's what became. The Lakeland Daryl Jones uh, signature model. Wow! Um, so that's what really kind of got me started. Just you know, trying stuff and looking at things. Um, Lakeland went when underwent some some issues uh, a number of years ago, and so they were not able to at this time pay the royalty, and so we pulled the instrument. But when the people who now are are taking care of Lakeland came back online, we decided to go back with them because we really liked the instrument and I love the company. Um, but during that time, I started just looking at, you know, more, you know, I looked at, um, I went to to, to the, the custom shop, I, you know, visited that and and somebody mentioned to me, I was teaching down at, um, teaching at uh, Musicians Institute and somebody mentioned to me, said, you know, now that you're an adjunct professor, you can take the, the uh, any class and I thought there's a luthier class Whoa. and so I took I took one semester of that class I don't even think I finished the class because I got called on to tour but I got back just in time to finish a bass and after I finished the bass at this at this time um John Carruthers was was the head of that department um at Musicians Institute so I went to him to make more of these instruments that I thought well maybe I'll sell a few you know you know it's you know and he you know helped me you know kind of um make it into a real you know a real you know professional instrument that that could be repeated and they could be you know they could be built that was that didn't have any of the issues that i had when i built my first bass in, in class you know and so um though he's not involved presently with uh, with jones musical instrument he is still somebody who is like a counselor and somebody who I go to and ask questions about certain things. Um, um, but yeah, and, and, you know, during that period after, you know, after uh, we went back with Lakeland, it just kind of stayed in my head, like all of these ideas, the stuff that I'd learned in the class. And I just decided, wow, man, I'd like to, to make a few instruments, you know, based on the things that I see that um, maybe some some companies have not brought forward from pre CBS instruments and just ideas that I had, and so it's it's you know I have to give thanks to to Leo Fender and all of those people who worked at that at you know in, in, in developing those instruments because this instru my instruments are based on those, but it's just a few you know a few modern twists yeah. CNC machines where when you want something to be the same way on every instrument. And enough, uh, you know, hands on that they are that that, that they're not just, um, you know, an instrument that just came off a line with nobody right. really caring for it. So that's basically what it is. It's a uh, it's a um, a desire to play instruments that speak to me, but that use some of the you know modern modern uh, technology to, um, to 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 so that you get something that is uh, that's repeatable. And that is um, scalable. I should yeah, say. yeah, and the experience people can all they can share the, the experience with, with those bases far out, yeah. man. That's cool. You know what's so cool about hearing you say that, Daryl? Is I see the 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 um, the connection between you being the student that was willing to learn at a young age. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. willing to get get the song right, get the whole the whole mm -hmm. song right, and then also use the word curious a lot. Um, so that sort of attention to detail and craft and then also your curiosity has led you to this that's that's what a trip man because it's, it's cool that you took that that luthier class i mean that's yeah yeah no i mean i yeah I'm just always i mean guitars man i 
um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm building some uh, some really interesting variations on the Telecaster and the Strat and the Stratocaster guitars. But man, I'm asking. I mean, I'm playing with all these great guitar players, <laughs> so I'm asking. You know, I'm asking guys. So hey, you know, I did a session um, this past uh, um, uh, October with Dean Parks. Cool. And uh, and man, I was just asking him so many questions, and he was so forthcoming. So yeah, man, I'm always trying to educate myself more about you know what I'm doing, and, and in many cases about stuff that I'm not doing, you know, yeah. and would like to do. That's awesome. I mean, look, the 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 new documentary is out now in the blood with Daryl Jones. It's available everywhere. It's an amazing story. I definitely recommend that you check it out if you're. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're familiar or unfamiliar with, with Daryl's rich legacy in the, the music business and community, um, there's a new song coming out very soon, Daryl, that, that bears the same name. Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, um, when the uh, when the film came out, you know, I basically, well, before the film came out, I was, I was basically working on the score for the film. And uh, the first song that we released, American Dream, that, you know, we released back in uh, October. We released that song, right? It was a um, yeah, it was, I think it was yeah. yeah. Basically, that song, the, the first song, it was a cue that I wrote for the part of the movie that's got a lot of black and white photography and it talks about the uh civil rights uh, movement in Chicago in the 60s and early 70s. And so I was writing a piece of music that I wanted to go with that. And as I after I wrote it, I realized, wait a minute, there's a song there. Totally. And of course, um, you know, the influence that I that I have from that period in Chicago are like, you know, Curtis Mayfield and James Brown and, you know, Sly Stone and, and uh, Jimi Hendrix and all those guys. So um, that's that particular song is very obviously very heavily influenced by uh, by by uh, Curtis Mayfield. This new song that we're going to release in the next few weeks um is a song um, that I wrote a number of years ago, but it's basically a song about family. And um, um, uh, it's written from the perspective of my brother and I growing up in our household and the lessons that we learned from my parents and and just how to go out into the world. And, 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 uh, and, and, and so, um, these things that I, you know, basically I lost both my parents, 2004 and 2008, um, in, you know, pretty close succession. Um, and so the song is in a way an homage to them and an, and, and a, 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 um, a way to basically say to them, we got what you taught us. We, you know, we have it now. And not only do we have it, but it's written in the blood which is how the name of the, the film, you know, how, how, how we came to name the film. It was based on that, you know, the, the, the title of the film is based on that song, In the Blood. And so it's, um, yeah, you know, and of course, like, you know, it's it's influenced by, you know, by, by, by Sly Stone, you know, maybe even I could, you know, be honest and say that it's definitely influenced by Family Affair. It's kind of like my, my, um, version of of that you know sentiment you know brought into like song form totally yeah i love that i, I you know I, I love the idea of 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 artists pulling reference from a song and seeing what they can do when they when they you know mm -hmm. they meditate at that or summon that i think that's um through steve man through, through steve jordan I, I was lucky enough to to meet and watch him talk to uh Khalees bell from mm -hmm. you know from cool in the gang oh, and, yeah uh, and that was cool to hear him because he would he he would call the references from the song, you know, mm -hmm. from, you know, it was oh yeah, you know, you know, this song came from this idea, you know, and such new beautiful art stems from that. It's 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 a great yeah, you yeah, know, I I think that uh, you know, like they say, man, you know, the greats steal from the greats. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it is like. Um, yeah. and, and, and and what and I guess you know I, I should also you know you know. Uh, add to that or preface that by saying when I sit down to write music the music of my childhood really does inform what I do and it's not like 
oh, I'm listening to the song and now I'm going to try to write, you know, it's not so much that it's just as, as, as much as as I sit down and start to write, I can think to myself that I can tell that that came from me listening to to Hendrix, you know, okay. or I can tell that that, you know, that that's, you know, my I can my influences come out and they just happen to be from this period from about 1960, you know, 1964, when I was three years old, until, you know, until I, you know, maybe, and of course, and that's, it's such a rich period also, you know, because you have artists like, you know, James Brown and, and, and Jimi Hendrix and, and uh, the Staples Singers and, and all of the band, and in a way, it, it also matches with what Angus was teaching me, the songs that he was teaching me when I was a kid. There was, you know, Led Zeppelin. There was, you know, uh, the band War. There was, yeah. um, you know, all of that stuff. It was a rich, rich, there's a rich, rich, rich musical heritage from that particular period when I was a kid. And so I think that I'm just, it's it's what I hear, you know, when I go, when I sit down to, to work on music. It's, it's not, it's not as... Um, it's not so deliberate. I guess maybe part of it is, but it's it's just, you know, it's what I hear, you know, when I when I when I hear music, you know, the the the, the, the music of my childhood, even more than the music of later on. You know. Totally. I feel like as you as you get older in life, music especially feels like uh it's almost like a wardrobe you could see, you know, it's, it's things that define you and and sort of what you wore and and, and you know, and and there's someone underneath it, you know. Yeah. But 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 on the out, you know, that's just it's what you wear, and and uh, and I agree. It's sometimes when you look back at the stuff from when you were younger, especially, it feels more part of who who you are as a person. You know, it's, yeah. it's you know, mm -hmm. I was a child of like the '90s, right? So I grew up with like I don't know all kinds of funky alternative rock shit. But like it's it's cool because it's just sort of like you know, it, it defines what you are into and it defines yeah. who you are. It, it feels like the chapters in the, you know, chapters mm -hmm. of who you are. So Daryl, yeah. um, maybe, maybe to, to, to put a bow on it, you know, talking about growth in life and, and the chapters of your life and, and all this stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's, it's a whole new terrain today than, than when you were coming up, when I was even coming up, I didn't have mm -hmm. resources like this where you could ping an artist through social media and then, be on be on the phone with them and talk to them and, and it's a totally different world um with that you know do you have any advice maybe to anyone out there right now that's young and and is picking up an instrument for the first time or maybe doesn't you know they're relying on digital teachers or online classes versus someone like you have you know, angus helping you you know any advice i think it's great that there is such a body of information that is so easily accessible the only thing I would add to that is be sure that you get out and play with other musicians. Don't just make it a thing where you're sitting around, ooh, now I can cop every lick that Stanley Clark ever played. I can put it on, you know, a quarter time and learn, you know, the ins and outs of it. I think that's a good idea to do that too. But then, then you got to like go out and play that stuff with somebody. You got to like... Um, yeah, no, I think it, it's it's so important that that uh, that musicians. I think it's maybe even more important now because of the fact that all of this stuff is so at your fingertips now. It's easy to easy to just go down that rabbit hole and just be a guy who cops everything from from all your faves, rather than getting out in the street and playing. You know, a bunch of you know a bunch of different kinds of things with musicians that you enjoy playing with and sometimes that you don't enjoy playing with all of those things are are going to be incredibly valuable to make you a whole musician you know i'm not saying don't you know don't cop stuff don't transcribe whether it be you know you know in terms of writing stuff out or just learning stuff from by ear which i think is also very important uh, but it's important to go out and play, play, play the music with with other musicians. And I would also say, um, I was very segregated in my thinking about the bass when I was a kid. How like so? my brother, my brother could play guitar, but I never really picked up the guitar for all of those years when I was a kid. You yeah. know, 
Yeah. And I would I would say now when I look back on that, I wish I had. Mm-hmm. I wish I had started writing songs a lot earlier. I wish I started singing a lot earlier because um, I think as Miles told me once, he said, Daryl, one art helps the other. So I think a little bit of cooking and a little bit of, you know, you know, you know, you know, using these different ingredients to come up with something. Totally. I think it's a great uh, way to teach yourself all of these different things, you know, photography and and drawing and and picking up a drum, you know, picking up some drumsticks and sitting at a, you know, particularly for a bass player. I think it's what would be. There's nothing that you can only you only have have to gain from seeing what it's like to be a drummer, you sure. know, as a bass player or as a guitar player or as a lead vocalist. You know, um, I think um, just having a much more curious and more um, integrative outlook on music in general. And I would say that that goes for not just learning how to play rock music, but if you decide that you want to be like a rock guy, you should learn a jazz tune or two, you know? And I think the f- thing, the same thing is vice versa. If you if you decide that you're going to be like the new, you know, the the new word in jazz, you should also be listening to some reggae music and 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 just be expanding on that because the guys who created that music that we're all so, you know, when I speak about jazz, the music that we're, we're all so enamored of and we all think so highly of, um, they were pushing boundaries. And I think that it's really important if you're going to play that music to also be pushing boundaries, not just going back and copying what Miles and the guys did on Four and More. But, you know, you you know, looking at what some of the you know cutting edge rap guys are doing, right. hip hop music, um, all, you know all of it. You know, if you're writing lyrics, you need to be listening to some country music because there's some incredible um, storytelling going on there. You know, and Absolutely. so I just feel like being a, a lot more integrative of different kinds of music, different kinds of arts. You know, I think that 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 that's something that I would I would stress to to young musicians who are, you know, who are coming up. Awesome, Daryl. That's so, that's so informative and, and, yeah. and awesome. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, man, I, I think, I, you know, I, I think this probably is, is a good place to, to probably pause and, and, okay. you know, thank you to the, to the fine folks at Bass Musician Magazine. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to, to hear the new song in the blog when it comes out. Uh, the documentary mm-hmm. is available now. Um, I Apple, am, Amazon Prime and Apple TV. We're working now to get it into Europe. We're working on that. Oh, right on. Oh, I wish you the best of yeah. luck with that. Uh, Darren mm-hmm. will be touring all over the world. So if you live anywhere in the world, he's likely to stop in a place near you. Uh, yeah. Daryl, one, one last quick question before we go. Do you think Miles Davis would have had a Twitter account? Uh, I think so. I think so. I think so. I think so. Also. Um, I, I'm, I'm now the big question is, uh, you know, what would he have been posting? Yes, you know, <laughs> and uh, that that's a that's a mind full of, of thought, you know.